Hello everyone, welcome to Ordinary People Stories. If you're interested, please like my video and subscribe to my channel. In my past life, I committed sins. In this life, my husband is starting a business. Last month, when Gu Yongbing placed the contract for 1 billion yuan joint debt in front of me and asked me to sign it, my head was buzzing with this sentence. He knelt on the ground, lips trembling, asking me to sign. He told me that his company was at a critical juncture, in desperate need of 1 billion yuan to survive, and he had found a backer. However, the backer required the spouse to be a joint and several liability person. 1 billion yuan. I felt suffocated. As someone from an ordinary family, 1 billion yuan was an astronomical figure for me. You have to let me think about it, I said, feeling unsteady, squatting on the ground. Gu Yongbin held my hand. You're my wife, you'll support me, won't you? He had said this countless times since he started his business. If there were a time machine, I would definitely sit in it without hesitation, go back to when I first met Gu Yongbin, and adamantly refuse to marry him. It's too hard. Gu Yongbin is my husband, but also a life mentor worshipped by everyone, a big V with millions of fans across the internet. He came from poverty, almost starving to death as a child, raised by various families. He had the humblest of beginnings. However, he had an indomitable spirit. After obtaining a diploma from a vocational school, he refused to settle for mediocrity and entered the capital city with only 800 yuan in his pocket. He slept under bridges, was chased away as a vagrant, but eventually his good eloquence earned him a job as a trainer. While working as a trainer, he seemed to discover his potential. His lively teaching style, coupled with live streaming, led to someone uploading his class videos online, and he quickly gained fame, becoming a beloved Big V. With fame and influence came business opportunities and honors. Packaged by the company, he became a winner in life, a life mentor. He gave lectures every month, guiding young people fresh out of school as a spiritual father figure. As for me, I'm just an ordinary, or rather, extraordinarily ordinary financial worker. Talking about my fate with Gu Yongbin also stemmed from my attending one of his speeches out of curiosity. As a well-known Big V, Gu Yongbin's speeches were deeply inspiring and struck a chord with me. I gathered my courage, set aside my pride, and expressed my love to him, and he responded quickly. Six months after we met, we entered the halls of marriage. Now looking back, that decision was too hasty. At that time, I was immersed in the joy of my idol becoming my partner and overlooked some other qualities he exhibited. Like his lack of attention to appearance. Like his chauvinism. Like his stubbornness. At the time, I saw these as his unique qualities. His lack of attention to appearance was being above trivial matters. His chauvinism was the broad-mindedness of a man. His stubbornness was the courage to go it alone. But after getting married, especially in the first two or three years of marriage, this filter gradually faded, and I began to complain occasionally. He really could let a bottle of oil spill in front of him without lifting a finger. When I asked him, he justified himself, saying, my time is precious. How can I waste it on such trivial matters? This catchphrase became even more frequent after he started his business. Speaking of Gu Yongbin's entrepreneurship, I felt embarrassed for him. I blushed at what Gu Yongbin had done in the past few years. After marrying me, he wholeheartedly threw himself into the smartphone production trend. Unfortunately, this industry required high technical reserves and a sound supply chain, not just a few ideas and clever design concepts to succeed. At the beginning of his entrepreneurial journey, with his good connections and the halo of being a big V, he had plenty of publicity, even captivating the masses wouldn't be an exaggeration. Unfortunately, when the finished product came out, the shortcomings in production capacity and the low yield of quality products for novice smartphone makers were quickly exposed. Consumers vote with their feet, and nobody pays for your sentimentality. Gu's first venture, his phone-making career, ended dramatically in failure. In the end, he left behind a mess, which was acquired by industry bigwigs. But the big shots made it clear, all employees would be brought into the big shots new team, except Gu. 
Gu wasted more than two years of his time making phones. During these two years, I saw and felt his hard work. He didn't come home until one or two in the morning every day, suffered from severe insomnia, and sometimes had sudden panic attacks during meals, afraid to see people. As his wife, I was exhausted and heartbroken. Gu was not someone who would settle for the status quo. After staying at home for a month or two, he pulled his former buddies together for a new venture. This time, he ventured into the electronic cigarette field. E-cigarettes have also been a small trend in the past two years. With slogans like youthfulness and health, they became popular among young people. When Gu Yongbin entered this track, he was full of confidence and intended to make a big splash. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned. The government soon introduced policies to strictly regulate e-cigarettes, cutting off online sales channels. Suddenly, the entire e-cigarette industry plummeted. Gu's second venture ended up stillborn. For the third attempt, he wanted to focus on social networking. He confidently proposed reforms to the existing SMS sending methods. However, after the product came out, it only gained popularity for two weeks, then quickly cooled off, with no one interested. One or two failures might be chalked up to bad luck, but three or four failures might indicate some problems. In the business world, only winners can laugh, while losers become objects of ridicule. Gu's repeated failures earned him the title of the dark lamp of the industry. This title was a huge mockery for an entrepreneur. Some might say Gu was naturally gifted, or that his bullheadedness and refusal to turn back unless hitting a wall drove him. After his failure in social networking, he spent two months recuperating at home before plunging into an even more capital-intensive industry, internet car manufacturing. Anyone with a little understanding of the industry knows how deep the waters of internet car manufacturing are and how many predecessors have fallen into this pit and never climbed out. However, Gu seemed to be possessed, throwing himself into this battlefield without hesitation. Thanks to his adherence to business rules, although he had failed before, people were still willing to follow him and invest in him. Soon, his car manufacturing business began with great fanfare. Every time he started a new venture, I used to celebrate his success with him over a meal at the revolving restaurant on the top floor of the Beijing TV Tower. It was the highest place in Beijing, standing here gave you a sense of overlooking the world, embracing it in your arms. However, this time, although Gu's car manufacturing business began with great fanfare, I didn't feel like celebrating with him anymore. Perhaps he was naturally gifted, perhaps it was his bullheadedness or his refusal to turn back, but I was just an ordinary person, and my heart couldn't handle such great ups and downs. After several years of entrepreneurship, he had hardly slept peacefully, and neither had I. Watching the world mock him as his wife, I couldn't hold my head up at family gatherings. My family was considered intellectual, while Gu was considered a bumpkin. My parents had been opposed to our marriage, but back then, Gu was still a successful man, so they didn't say much. Now that he had completely fallen into the mud, my parents' complaints about him were no longer hidden. Every time I went back to my parents' house, my mother would pull me aside and say I looked a little more haggard again, then the conversation would turn to scolding Gu. Her most frequent words to me were, You're just silly. You used to call him a promising stock, and now all your cousin's children are successful, living well, and here you are, becoming a worn-out woman. It's unrealistic to say I have no complaints about him at all. The only thing I could comfort myself with, and even joke about with my friends, was that at least he won't cheat. He's so busy that he even runs to the bathroom, and there's simply no time for him to have affairs. Then life slapped me hard. When Gu first started his business, I often visited his company, but later, as the company grew, I didn't go often anymore. However, I still knew his core team and partners. Among his partners, there was only one person who had been with Gu for a long time, a spirited woman named Meng Jie. Recently, rumors spread in the company that Gu and Meng Jie were having an affair, and the rumors were quite convincing. Gu had visibly fallen on hard times in recent years, and only love could explain why a female partner would stick with him until now. 
I didn't believe it at first, but soon enough, evidence was presented to me. An employee of Gu's company, whom I was close to, sent me a few photos. In these photos, Meng Jie and Gu were seen entering and leaving high-end places together, dressed formally and looking intimate. Sometimes, Meng Jie even held Gu's hand. In the photos, Meng Jie looked radiant, the kind of woman that would make others jealous. Holding these photos, looking at Meng Jie in the pictures, and then at the gray, ordinary me in the mirror, I suddenly began to doubt the idea that Gu would never cheat. People change, don't they? Moreover, considering the few years we've spent alone together, they could be counted on one hand. He didn't come home until midnight every day, sometimes even later, and my job was also very busy. We hardly had any free time, and the little free time we did have was mostly used by him to catch up on sleep. The person he spent the most time with was his colleagues, his partners. The person he spent the most time with was Meng Jie. Just last month, Meng Jie had returned from a business trip to Japan with Gu. Gu explained to me that they went to Japan to seek craftsmanship. He had always admired Japan's so-called spirit of craftsmanship. He showed me some photos he took in Japan, and the one smiling under the cherry blossom trees with him was also Meng Jie. I suddenly realized that my emotions might have hit a red light. But I didn't even have time to question old Gu. He was just too busy, and I didn't have any solid evidence of his infidelity. I wouldn't go to the company to cause a scene like a shrew, it's not my style. Today, he finally came home early, and I was planning to have a serious talk about our relationship issues. But to my surprise, he suddenly presented a joint loan agreement for 1 billion yoy, which left me dumbfounded. At night, I lay in bed, tossing and turning. We've been sleeping in separate rooms for a while now. His schedule is so irregular, and he's afraid of disturbing me, so he sleeps in the guest room. Thinking about the recent rumors and the fact that old Gu just knelt before me and asked me to sign a 1 billion yun loan contract, how could I possibly fall asleep peacefully? The internet car industry where old Gu works indeed requires substantial capital, but he's still in the software development phase, far from actual production. There's no need for that much money yet. Moreover, from the time he started making cars until now, it's only been about half a year. I know that venture capital firms have invested a lot of money in him, which, according to him, should be enough to sustain the company for a year. So how could he suddenly claim to be out of money and need to borrow 1 billion yuan? The more I thought about it, the more suspicious it seemed. In my mind, words like conspiracy, embezzlement, mistress, and escape kept swirling around. Calculating over these years, each time he started a new venture, he almost always used some of our family's money. Although he still made money through his speeches, our family's wealth not only failed to increase but also decreased over the years. Old Gu himself has accumulated some debts, and while I don't know the exact amount, it's certainly not a small sum. I also don't believe there is such a thing as an idealist who would sacrifice everything for the sake of their career. So what's the deal with his frequent outings with his female partner? His frequent overseas trips? Is it all just business trips as he claims? And what does he need this billion yun for? A sense of immense uncertainty suddenly gripped my heart, making it hard to breathe. Old Gu? Are you really planning to abscond with Meng Jie, disappearing to a place where no one can find you, to live a life of luxury? With one billion yuan, you could live luxuriously anywhere. Unbeknownst to me, tears dampened my pillow. Suddenly, a warm tongue licked my face. I turned to see my family's pet dog, Tieju. Tieju was originally old Gu's dog, and it is said that it followed him through his ups and downs, witnessing his transformation from a nobody to a life coach. Tieju is an old dog, very old. It's probably about 14 or 15 years old, which in dog years is equivalent to 70 or 80 in human years. Its decline is evident. Its body is covered in patches of baldness, and it wheezes like a bellows with every breath, panting heavily after just a few steps. What's worse, it has a huge tumor under its neck, which the vet said was malignant. Its departure is just a matter of time. The doctor's advice was euthanasia. 
The exact words were, this dog no longer has any salvageable value. It lives in pain every day, so it's better to let it die without suffering. On this point, I stand with the veterinarian. But old Goo, due to his deep emotional attachment to the old dog, refused to agree. He said he would never abandon it or actively end its life while it could still live. Old Goo's words are still fresh in my mind. Tieju's tongue licked my face, and it panted even more heavily, like an old person coughing up phlegm. I suddenly felt incredibly annoyed. This dog seemed to embody old Goo, and seeing it was like seeing a part of him. And is our marriage also like this old dog, barely clinging to life? Sorrow overwhelmed me and I waved Tieju away. It looked at me with a sad expression before leaving, as if lamenting something. Everything in this house felt suffocating, hopeless. I fell asleep crying. When I woke up again, I was shaken awake by old Goo. Wife, have you thought about it? He asked, his face showing exhaustion and anxiety. The company's cash flow won't last much longer, I need to settle this loan as soon as possible. Why is the company suddenly out of money? This time, I didn't follow his every word like before, but instead questioned him with a firm tone. Old Gu explained to me, roughly saying that there were issues with the research and development team, operations, and in addition, a collaborating company had swindled a large sum of money from him. The CEO of that company swindled his money, declared bankruptcy, and had already transferred the assets before Old Goo sued. Although the court ruled that the other party needed to compensate Old Goo, there were indeed no assets under the CEO's name. The CEO now seems to be penniless, working on a construction site every day. Whenever Old Goo asks for money, the CEO just says, How about I settle today's wages for you? This infuriates Old Goo. After listening to his explanation, my doubts didn't diminish. This amount of money is just too much. I looked at old Goo and slowly said to him, I'm just a small woman, not a business tycoon. I don't understand much about business matters. We still plan to have children, and our family can't be left without a safety net. I don't expect you to solely support the family, but we can't push our family into the abyss either. He sensed my implication and swore to me earnestly. Wife, rest assured, I won't make the same mistake again. The team is now mature, and we've overcome the technical challenges. Giving up now would render everything we've done before pointless. I've always believed you to be a wise woman. Trust me, I won't gamble away our family's future. Old Goo's words were firm. He had this kind of infectious charisma that made people around him believe in him. However, at that moment, his phone rang, lighting up with the caller ID Mengjia. And Mengjia's profile picture was a photo of her and old Gu feeding deer in Nara, Japan. I smiled, a somewhat bitter smile. You should take the call first. I need to consider this matter carefully. After all, it's a billion yuan, not just loose change, old Gu. Without giving him a chance to speak, I rushed out of the room and started the car. I needed to clear my head and let out some steam. In the rearview mirror, I saw old Goo awkwardly chasing after me, his oversized pants loosely hanging from his waist, almost tripping him up. With his unwashed hair and weary eyes, he didn't look like a successful man at all at that moment. He looked so pathetic, like one of those mediocre middle-aged men facing a midlife crisis. Think it over. I won't let you down, wife. Old Goo futilely shouted from behind the car. I floored the accelerator, and the car shot forward. Driving for dozens of kilometers, deep into the mountains around Beijing, I finally felt some of the pent-up tension in my chest dissipate. On the way, I kept thinking about what I should do in the coming days. There was no doubt that my marriage had already hit a red light. A woman with whom Old Goo shared a revolutionary friendship, had forcefully inserted herself into our lives and facing her, I inexplicably felt intimidated. Over the years, they had been the ones who understood each other the most, while I felt like an outsider. What's worse, now my husband was plotting against me, trying to get me to sign a massive loan agreement, and most likely, he and Meng Jie were planning to flee together, possibly to a place where no one could find them, 
leaving me to face the enormous debt alone. I absolutely wouldn't allow this to happen. Though I'm just an ordinary woman, the potential unleashed by any woman after losing faith in her man is extraordinary. Dialing a number from my phone, I made the call. Cousin, why do you have time to call me? A lazy voice came from the other end. My cousin, Chen Chao? In our family, he's somewhat of an outlier. Most of our family members are conventional, study well, and find impressive jobs after graduation. My cousin, however, disliked studying from a young age, didn't attend any reputable schools, but was said to be exceptionally skilled with computers, and had a lot of miscellaneous friends. Whenever our family encountered problems that couldn't be solved by the normal rules, they often turned to my cousin. Surprisingly, in most cases, my cousin could provide a solution. I suspect your brother-in-law is cheating. Now I need his travel records, hotel bookings, call logs from the past three months, etc. Can you help me get them? Sis, are you serious? Brother-in-law couldn't possibly do such a thing. My cousin's voice rose several decibels on the other end. Unlike other members of our family, my cousin is a diehard fan of old goo. This filter hasn't faded even now. I chuckled coldly. So, between your sister and your brother-in-law, who do you choose? There was a moment of silence on the other end, then came the reply. I'll give you an answer in 30 minutes, sis. After instructing my cousin, I lit a cigarette in the car. I don't usually smoke, but seeing an open pack of cigarettes in the car, I decided to light one up. The strong smoke choked me, tears streaming down my face. At the same time, another thought came to mind. Just because I don't smoke doesn't mean I don't know about it. These cigarettes were much slimmer and longer than regular men's cigarettes, with a hint of mint flavor. They were women's cigarettes. Why would there be women's cigarettes in the car that old Gu usually uses? I could almost imagine Meng Jie sitting in my current position, elegantly lighting up a cigarette in the car. It's so disgusting. I couldn't hold back the nausea and pushed open the car door, vomiting in the desolate wilderness. Looking at the mess on the ground, I smiled bitterly. It was like my life right now, wasn't it? After a short wait, my cousin called me right on time and unexpectedly reported that old Gu's recent life trajectory was unusually normal. According to my cousin, old Gu's driving route was basically a straight line between home and the office. He even checked old Gu's public transportation and taxi records, but there was no data. This was quite in line with old Gu's personality. Everyone knew he was a workaholic, a master of public speaking, but few knew that he was actually socially anxious and disliked unnecessary socializing. Moreover, the hotel records basically matched what he reported to me every time. However, there were many records of him and Meng Jie going on business trips together, but they always booked separate rooms. My cousin even accessed old Gu's shopping information on certain e-commerce platforms. Most of the purchases were office supplies, with very few personal items for himself, and naturally, I didn't see any gifts he bought for Meng Jie. Could it be that I misunderstood old Gu? The information my cousin provided was too clean, leaving my doubts unresolved and even growing. Was I really overthinking things? Wait a minute. Old Gu has been in the business world for so many years. If he were meticulously cheating, changing his phone or using someone else's ID card wasn't impossible. Since I couldn't break through from him, I decided to try from Meng Jie's side. I believed that no one could be seamless. The emoji my cousin sent me was a smiling face, perfect for starting a conversation. I opened WeChat, selected Meng Jie and sent it to her. Not long after, she replied, What's wrong, sister-in-law? This sister-in-law sounded so casual. I thought to myself silently. It's nothing. I just wanted to ask you, how's the company doing lately? Old Gu has been sighing a lot at home these days, and I don't want to ask directly. Meng Jie replied, There are some minor issues, but don't worry, sister-in-law, they'll be resolved soon. Resolved soon? Does that mean you two are about to get rid of this trouble? I conversed with her in a perfunctory manner and ended the conversation. Half an hour later, 
My cousin sent me some information he found on Meng Jie's phone. This time, there was finally some valuable information. Meng Jie had been planning to sell a house recently. He even used the phone's camera to see where Meng Jie was right now. Surprisingly, it was a real estate agency. My cousin converted the camera's footage into a video and sent it to me. In the video, Meng Jie and the agent were chatting anxiously. I faintly heard phrases like lowering the price for a quick sale and must move out by the end of this month. According to the information on the second-hand housing trading app on her phone, I easily found out where the house she wanted to sell was located. Huh? According to the search results, this house was under the name of Old Goo's company. And Old Goo was the absolute majority shareholder of the company, so it was natural for this house to belong to Old Goo. So, is she selling the house on behalf of Old Goo? Is this the plot of planning to run away upon discovering that things are not right? Sis, it seems that this woman really has some feelings for your brother-in-law. My cousin Chen Chao timely delivered another blow. He sent me some chat records between Meng Jie and Old Gu. Most of these records were everyday exchanges, but a few of them seemed to cross the line. Such as, I miss you. Such as, I drank a lot today because the suppliers forced me to, it would have been great if you were here. Such as, don't lose heart, even if everyone else leaves, I'll still be by your side. There were no more overly intimate messages. What slightly reassured me was that old Gu's replies to her were neither too distant nor too ambiguous. Whenever Meng Jie's words seemed to cross the line, old Gu would appropriately steer the conversation back. Sis, I've finished reading. Don't worry, your brother-in-law's feelings for you are still the same. I knew when you two got together that you'd grow old together. Chen Chao performed his duty well, truly a diehard fan of old Gu. Are you my brother or his brother? Why do you always favor him? I reprimanded my cousin with irritation, but I felt slightly relieved in my heart. However, it seems that my brother-in-law's business has indeed encountered major problems. Ah, fate is so unpredictable. In the recent chat records between Meng Jie and Old Gu, Old Gu appeared very worried. The situation he mentioned to me this morning was confirmed in his chat records with Meng Jie. In reality, things were even worse than what he described to me. The main culprit behind the collapse of Old Gu's company's funding chain was the CEO of one of their downstream manufacturers, known as Lao Yang. Old Gu and Lao Yang had been friends for many years. Shortly after Old Gu's company obtained financing, they gave a large sum of money to Lao Yang's company for building production lines, developing intelligent car assembly, and subsequent mass production. Unexpectedly, Lao Yang developed a serious gambling addiction at some point. He took the money Old Gu gave him and only built the factory buildings superficially. The core machinery, technicians, and everything else were not in place, and most of the money was spent on gambling in Macau. It was said that he lost tens of millions in just one gambling session. When Old Gu found out about this and went to settle accounts with Lao Yang, Lao Yang directly declared bankruptcy for the factory. The factory was liquidated in bankruptcy, and when the court investigated Lao Yang's assets, they found that he was completely broke. No one could say exactly how much he lost in the casino. Anyway, he was now nominally a pauper, working as a laborer on a construction site. Old Gu did go to the construction site to find Lao Yang, but Lao Yang retorted, I'm just a laborer now. How about you help me carry these bricks? It almost gave Old Gu a stroke. Confirming that Old Gu didn't lie to me, I felt relieved but also deeply hopeless. Old Gu's company was on the verge of collapse, and his last hope might be this staggering one billion loan. Otherwise, he wouldn't be selling the company's properties at low prices while property prices in Beijing were still soaring. However, after so many years of entrepreneurship and repeated failures, even I, his closest confidant, began to doubt his future. He had the ability, I won't deny that, but perhaps he was just lacking in luck. Sometimes, that slight difference in luck could make all the difference. Was I really going to bear this debt of over a hundred million with him? Just thinking about it made me breathless. Sis, don't be foolish. 
never agree to Gu Yongbin's request for you to sign a joint loan agreement. My cousin saw this in the chat between Meng Jie and old Gu, and immediately called me without hesitation. His voice was deafening over the phone. It's been so many years, and you've seen the result of his entrepreneurship. Deep in debt. This time it's not a small amount, it's one billion. Do you know what that means? Our whole family couldn't earn that much even if we didn't eat or drink from the Qing dynasty until now. Chen Chao was truly anxious. I found it a bit amusing. Aren't you his loyal fan? Chen Chao's voice was urgent. I admire him for his character and knowledge, but as a businessman, as a good husband, he's indeed not up to par. Sis, we come from a humble background, don't be foolish. My mind is in chaos, let me think about it. I hung up the phone before Chen Chao could finish. Did he think I didn't know what he was saying? As the saying goes, husband and wife are birds of the same forest, when disaster strikes, each flies their own way. Now, is it time for us to labor and fly together? Not long after, my mom called me urgently. Divorce. Divorce immediately, what's there to hesitate about? That guy surnamed Gu got himself into debt, why should he drag you down? My mom's tone became unprecedentedly solemn. Don't be foolish. Quickly draw a line with him now, divorce. We won't help him with his debts. If you can't say it, I'll go tell him. I hurriedly stopped my mom. Mom, he's already troubled enough for the sake of the company, don't make it worse, I'll talk to him myself. My mom snorted on the other end of the phone. He's unreliable on ordinary days, and he even wants to drag you down into the pit now. Have you seen his true colors now? If you don't divorce, are you waiting for New Year's? After hanging up my mom's call, I drove home with a heavy heart. I felt torn between joy and sorrow. I was glad that the factor of old Gu's infidelity was most likely ruled out, but I was worried about the heavy burden of debt hanging over my head. All the while, my mom and my cousin's words kept echoing in my mind. My reason told me that what they said was right. I didn't marry old Gu expecting great wealth, but he couldn't push me into an abyss of no return. Here is the translation. I hesitated for quite some time before finally going up to my home. Perhaps it was time to bring things to a conclusion. The door was left ajar, and I initially thought of just pushing it open, but for some reason, I stopped in my tracks. Inside, I heard some faint noises. It was the heavy, wheezing breaths of Tiaju, as if he could depart at any moment. Old Gu's voice followed, carrying a hint of tears. What should I do? The doctor says you don't have long to live, and I know it too. Perhaps euthanasia would be better for you. But I just can't bring myself to make that decision. I've always held on to hope, even if it's one in a million chance, that you'll get better. From childhood until now, I've always been like this, clinging to a glimmer of hope, deceiving myself. Even if there is just a tiny possibility, I can't bear to give up. For you, for this family, for the company, it's always been this way. Letting go would certainly be easier, but would persevering be more noble? The world is full of sophisticated egoists, and I, this incorrigible idealist, do I really have no reason to exist? The sound of old Goose suppressed sobbing filled the room. Initially restrained, it suddenly erupted into loud wails at some point. Unable to resist, I pushed open the door and walked in. Old Goo looked at me tearfully. I looked back at him, feeling deeply moved. You're not alone. You still have me. I handed him a pack of tissues without much kindness. Quickly wipe away the tears and snot from your face. It's unsightly. What would your employees and investors think if they saw you like this? Wife, have you decided to sign that loan agreement? He asked, sniffing. If you don't sign, I won't blame you. I know this situation has exceeded the capacity of any normal person to endure. It makes me feel queasy just thinking about it, let alone you. I won't sign, I said, looking him straight in the eye. I could see his gaze quickly dim. Just as he was racking his brains to find a topic to ease the awkwardness, I continued speaking. 
But I will take on the responsibility with you and keep the company going. Trust me. In the time that followed, I took a long leave and deeply immersed myself in the financial work of Old Goo's company. My professional skills came in handy at this time. I was very familiar with Old Goo's style of doing things, highly emotional and willing to pay a high price for a good idea or for perfection. Initially, to recruit a unique designer, he was willing to promise company shares and offer an exorbitant salary. In terms of the company's operations, he was also lavish, letting his subordinates spend freely. This led to a vicious cycle where his subordinates would come to him for money when they ran out, and Old Goo would resort to financing or borrowing. After taking over the financial work, I painstakingly sorted out his years of bad debts, figuring out what was owed, what should be paid, and which expenditures were unnecessary. The more I dug into it, the more shocked I was. The money Old Goo had invested in his business, I dare not say half, but at least one third of it was wasted. I felt both heartache and relief. Thankfully, he hadn't expanded the company's scale further, and he still had enough authority in the company. Otherwise, everything would have been beyond repair. While sorting out the accounts, I had old Goo list out every debt he owed. After listing them out, I finally understood why his debts were so massive. Among these debts, there were large corporate operating loans from banks, some even in the tens of millions, as well as small loans with interest rates exceeding 36% per annum, and he had maxed out many credit cards. Additionally, he had borrowed millions from friends intermittently. I categorized these debts in terms of repayment priority, those related to Winjun information had to be repaid first, friends' debts could wait until we earned some money, and all those high-interest loans would not be repaid. Using my identity as Old Goo's wife, I tirelessly called friends who were demanding repayment from Old Goo, explaining the current problems the company was facing and leaving them with hope, begging them to give Old Goo more time. These were things Old Goo would absolutely never do based on his personality. He was extremely concerned about his reputation and would even repay his friend's debts promptly despite resorting to high-interest loans from institutions. But since I had taken over now, I laid down the law for him, and everything had to be done according to my instructions. At the same time, I mobilized my relationships with my university classmates and friends. Many of my friends worked in banks or investment institutions. I listed out the debts Old Goo urgently needed to repay, roughly around 20 million. The remaining debts could be postponed. These 20 million debts were owed to seven or eight different banks, each lending several million. My idea was to optimize the debts, transferring these scattered debts from various banks to one major bank, while extending the repayment period as much as possible. Hard work pays off. After countless setbacks, a bank finally extended an olive branch to Old Goo's company. This bank carefully examined the current situation of Old Goo's company and believed that there was still a chance for a turnaround. They issued a credit line of around 20 million to the company. With this credit line, we could pay off the debts Old Goo urgently needed to repay, leaving the rest to be dealt with slowly. When I expressed gratitude to the bank president through intermediaries, he also had a message relayed to me. He said that his wife had once worked on a business project with Old Goo. Although the project failed, Old Goo's qualities as a Confucian businessman left all the employees without any grievances against him. Furthermore, he believed that Old Goo had the capability to turn the company around, but he lacked a bit of luck. Upon learning this, I couldn't help but sigh. Old Goo might have long forgotten about an ordinary female employee in his company, but it was his wholehearted dedication to all his employees that earned him their generous rewards later on. With the debt temporarily optimized, Old Goo's company finally gained some breathing space. But it was just that, a breathing space. To develop further, money was still needed. The first person I thought of was Lao Yang, who had cheated Old Goo out of money. With a woman's intuition, I believed that Lao Yang still had money hidden away, just concealed through very discreet means. If I could uncover his hidden funds, it would thoroughly help Old Gu's company through its current difficulties. I secretly observed Lao Yang and, as Old Gu had mentioned, Lao Yang was indeed working on a construction site, 
carrying bricks for 200 yuan a day. He ate and slept on the site, living in a makeshift dormitory. He truly seemed down and out. But I refused to believe this situation. I made a bold decision to approach Lao Yang directly. After sorting out the company's bad debts and completing debt optimization, I proposed to old Goop that I needed to disappear for a while. He was somewhat bewildered and asked me what I was going to do. I told him not to worry, to focus on running the company well during this time, and that I would find a way out for him. The next day I appeared at the construction site disguised as a cook. While queuing for food, I noticed Lao Yang's eyes light up momentarily upon seeing me. Being a rarity on a construction site filled with male hormones, I knew exactly what those men were whispering about behind my back. I didn't care, I was here to fish. And all I could see was the fish. In the following days, whenever Lao Yang had a break from bricklaying, he would always find an excuse to exchange pleasantries with me. However, he always maintained a respectful distance, never crossing any boundaries. After all, he had once been a figure of status and even now, in his fallen state, he still needed to maintain a certain dignity in front of the regular workers. This might be Lao Yang's last shred of dignity. As for me, I kept a certain distance from Lao Yang. While queuing for food, I would always treat him a little better and engage in occasional conversations with him, but I wouldn't pay much attention to anyone else. During our interactions, I deliberately portrayed myself as someone with a certain level of taste and ambition, but due to bad luck, had ended up cooking for a living on a construction site. Even within the role of a cook, I stood out. Every time, I would apply makeup and even spray some perfume, wearing a few accessories. These were items that the petty bourgeoisie could afford, not too expensive but still adding a touch of class. After this tug of war lasting about two months, finally, one evening, Lao Yang asked me out. Under the moonlight, Lao Yang expressed his love for me. I deliberately appeared cold and told him that my life goal was clear to find a wealthy man who could help me, not a laborer on a construction site. Unable to bear the provocation, he told me that he used to be a big boss, very wealthy, worth hundreds of millions. But he had run into some trouble recently and needed to keep a low profile. However, before the trouble started, he had already transferred his assets. He was still a wealthy man, just pretending to be a bricklayer on the surface. The assets he had transferred were still accessible whenever he needed them. I burst out laughing loudly, telling Lao Yang not to pretend to be rich when he was not, and giving him a disdainful look before walking away. The next day, while queuing for food, Lao Yang asked me out again in the evening. I pretended to be annoyed, but he earnestly insisted that I must meet him, saying that I would regret it if I didn't. That night, I reluctantly agreed to meet him. When I saw him, he directly handed me a car key. With him acting like a thief, he led me to an underground parking lot near a shopping mall. A Porsche was quietly parked there. Lao Yang said that as long as I agreed to be his mistress, the car would be mine. I expressed just the right amount of surprise, couldn't help but ask Lao Yang, are you serious? Are you really a hidden billionaire, pretending to be a laborer to avoid debts? Lao Yang whistled, his face turning red. It was evident that successfully showing off in front of a woman he liked gave him a great sense of accomplishment. I told you, I'm a billionaire boss. I collaborated with a fool before and effortlessly took away tens of millions from him. But now I need to keep a low profile. Don't worry, I've already arranged for someone to smuggle me out. When the time comes, you'll come with me. With this money, we can live lavishly abroad. I've also established connections there, so we can immigrate together. I feigned being dazzled by the future he painted, foolishly asking him where he transferred his assets. He probably thought it was a test of my trust in him, so he divulged all the channels he used to transfer the money without any guard. In reality, it was similar to what I had guessed. He indeed went to Macau to gamble, but he didn't lose that much. Instead, under the guise of gambling, he laundered the cash through various channels, turning it into clean money, and then entrusted it to people he considered trustworthy. You're quite interesting, I smiled faintly. Being able to train those mistresses so well is quite impressive. 
But will you discard me tomorrow after you've used them today? You're different, he looked at me, his eyes seeming to burn with fire. I felt you were different the moment I saw you. Of course, I'm different. I thought silently to myself. I'm here to seek revenge. What Young didn't know was that ever since I started dealing with him, I had been recording our conversations. After he confessed the channels through which he transferred his assets to me, the next day there was one less cook at the construction site where he worked. Armed with this evidence, I went to the court's enforcement division. There was nothing complicated about Young owing money to Lao Gu. The court had already ruled on it long ago, but they couldn't find his assets to execute. With my evidence, however, the court quickly located Young's money. After handing the recordings to Lao Gu, he listened to them with a mix of surprise and joy. When he asked how I obtained them, I didn't want to say anything. I just wanted to go to sleep. I was too tired. The experiences of this period had drained all my energy. All my wit, all my acting had been exhausted during these few months of intense dedication. Let me rest for a few days, and I'll tell you later. I needed to sleep for three days and three nights. I didn't break my promise. I said I would sleep for three days and three nights, and I actually did. When I woke up, I found Lao Gu sitting beside me, gently holding Iron Pillar and looking at me. He told me that Yang's debt had been collected. The company could finally survive. Now I know how good a wife I have, Lao Gu said, holding my hand and gently kissing it. He wasn't good at expressing his emotions, and such gestures were only seen when we got married. Oh, and there's good news, Lao Gu said, holding Iron Pillar's paw with his hand and greeting me. Then he asked me to look at the lump on Iron Pillar's neck. During this period, Iron Pillar's condition has shown signs of improvement too. Honey, the dark days are finally passing. Lao Gu laughed like a child. I hadn't seen him laugh like this since he started his business. Even Iron Pillar made wheezing sounds, still panting, but surprisingly, his eyes were no longer cloudy and had regained some brightness. That's great! During the celebration at Lao Gu's company, he spent an hour and a half praising me during the two-hour speech. I'm not one to boast, and being praised so extravagantly in front of hundreds of company employees made me feel uncomfortable. At the subsequent reception, almost everyone got drunk. They celebrated wildly, marking the end of the company's darkest days and finally seeing a glimmer of hope. Lao Gu drank the most, being carried to the restroom several times. He would vomit, then drink again and repeat the cycle. In the entire venue, only I and another woman remained sober. Meng Chie. After seeing me greet the employees who came up to call me sister-in-law one after another, I sat exhausted in a corner. Meng Jie walked over with a drink in her hand. You're a very good woman. A very good wife, she said sincerely. Thank you, I don't deny it, I replied, taking the ice-cold drink she offered and drinking it all in one go. She looked at the faraway Lao Gu, who was drunk, crying and laughing like a child, and softly spoke, I used to be very resentful. Clearly, we were more like partners with better understanding, whether in work or in other aspects. But why did he choose you? Now, I understand. I can never be like you, she chuckled self-deprecatingly. If my man presented me with a loan agreement worth a billion, the only thing I could do would be to immediately end the marriage and stay as far away from him as possible, preferably never to see him again. Her eyes dimmed, shaking her head, she lifted the glass of red wine on the table and drank it all. I truly am what he said, a sophisticated egoist. Sister-in-law, she looked at me, her voice filled with sincerity. This was the first time she had called me that, as far as I could remember. I smiled and raised the glass of red wine on the table, clinking it with hers.